Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to participate in this panel and share some of our experience and thoughts about intravascular robotics. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. And uh, um, just by way of disclosure, um, um, uh, I think you had a chance to look at that. Or, sorry, thank <laughs> you. Um, uh, next, next, please. So we became interested in, in vascular robotics, uh, looking at the increasing importance of robotics in healthcare in general, and looked at the potential of robotics as bringing about reduced radiation exposure to patients, operators, and staff, perhaps in pro providing improved precision, and reducing the degree of vascular trauma associated with manual catheterization. It's a possible for solution for those of us involved in medical education and training physicians of multiple disciplines who have less foundational training experience, and also has the potential to facilitate more complex procedures for operators uh, who, who are missing this foundation. Uh, as we go to the next slide, um, we begin to see some of the components uh, uh, of the Magellan robotic system. Uh, on your left is the uh, arm, the robotic arm that stays on the patient's table side, and to your right uh, is the actual remote physician console. Uh, this can be coordinated at both the uh, remotely and the table side. And in this uh, animation, you can see uh, at first the uh, robotic remote uh, animation, and this is the robotic arm on the table involving the components that allow us to steer the device. We have the ability to control the guide wire in multiple directions, including advancement and rotation, as you see here, uh, as the wire is held within this driving system that exists on the robotic arm. All of this can be controlled uh, by this remote station. One of the other advantages of robotic catheterization is our ability to actually manipulate the catheter uh, in three dimensions. And we begin to think this way as we start to use robotics uh, in terms of trying to drive through the center of the vessel versus uh, tracking against the wall of the vessel as we advance the catheter uh, and the devices. In the next slide, uh, you'll see some of the movements uh, that exist uh, in the six French device. You can see here that, that it involves two points of motion, uh, a curvilinear change at the distal end, and you can see how we're actually changing the shape into a reverse headhunter uh, a, a long multi-purpose catheter, something resembling a right coronary, uh, as we have multiple controls in these two bending sites. The concept with the six French is different than with the uh, nine French coaxial system because of these multiple bend points and the, also the ability to actually obtain the distal sweep in 360 degrees, as you see uh, in this tabletop demonstration. Here you can see the three principal uh, um, catheters. Uh, that, that, are, that exist right now from, from a commercial point of view. Uh, the fundamental nine French uh, catheter, which involves a six French interluminal sheath and a, a, a six French uh, a sheath uh, and a, a leader catheter. The six French device in the middle, which is the one you just saw the animation of. And then the, uh, the uh, next generation project, product, which we should see soon, which also involves a movable sheath and the distal leader catheter. Uh, this will allow essentially introduction of any type of therapeutic uh, device that will fit through a seven French sheath. Uh, the uh, nine French allows uh, the equivalent of any six French ID uh, delivery. Next. One of the reasons we got interested in robotics uh, was some of the data that came about from uh, really the first generation uh, devices where, uh, where um, the group at Imperial College in London uh, looked at procedure time, number of catheter movements, and vessel access time to accomplish a prescribed number of tasks. And they compared this uh, uh, versus manual technique. And you can see in both of these actions, there was a seemingly dramatic uh, difference between robotic task uh, accomplishment and manual task accomplishment for the same uh, models. As we look at the next slide, uh, um, you'll see another thing, uh, another uh, 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 discovery that came out of their studies here, uh, and that relates to learning curve issues. If you look at group A, B, and C, um, they consist of a fellow's experience, an attending's experience, and an experienced attending's experience in accomplishing 
uh, very pre prescribed uh, catheterization tasks. Um, if you look at the gray column, the one on the left of the two columns, uh, you'll see this represents uh, conventional or manual catheterization, as you might expect, um, as uh, we move from, in, through, from a fellow to the more experienced attendings, the time to accomplishment, accomplish and, the, and the, uh, the task, the success of the task, the overall performance essentially improves um, with experience, something that we would naturally expect. However, if we look at the performance of robotics, um, it's almost the same between uh, the, the inexperienced fellow and the experienced attending, um, suggesting what I was alluding to before, the potential of robotics to allow us to accomplish tasks with lesser degrees of training. Um, this, we think, is an exciting uh, potential opportunity. Next. So if, as we look at the next slide, um, one of the other uh, studies that was done uh, by the group at Imperial College, and um, this was uh, Celia Riga, uh, uh, and Nick, Chek Nick Cheshire's group, is they began to look at the actual work done by manual catheterization, and they developed a very unique catheter tip tracking pro program, which you can see here on this uh, fluoroscopic image of, uh, of an arch and carotid with a bovine left carotid. Uh, and you can see the amount of wall hits and the amount of uh, catheter movement against the wall of a vessel during uh, diagnostic uh, catheterization in this patient uh, who had had a previous cabbage. Uh, most of us don't really look at this in a meaningful way, and, and, uh, but we began to become concerned as we saw this data, and here you can see uh, the same operator in a model um, doing manual catheterization on the left and robotic catheterization in the same anatomy on the right. And you begin to see what potential might be derived by robotic catheterization and reducing, reducing vascular trauma and making uh, our task of going from point A to point B much more efficient and in the case of treatment of carotid uh, disease, for instance, perhaps reducing the risk of distal embol embolization. <clears throat> as, we, as we look at the next slide uh, and movie, this will show you what the actual catheter room setup is. This is a patient who's actually undergoing uh, carotid angiography, um, and you can see where the remote station is positioned, uh, a number of uh, observers and, and so on, uh, are both uh, driving and learning from this. And from this remote position now, we can pretty much control everything. Of course, there's a nurse in the room managing the patient. And here you can see the demonstration of the robotic images that we monitor. Here's an example of uh, direction of a catheter uh, as we go around the arch. And what I want to point your attention to is the fact that instead of running along the roof of the arch, we're actually bending the catheter uh, to actually stay away from the wall, and we can do this with two motions, in this case the leader and then the sheath. Next. Here's some examples of catheterization of a left carotid artery and then a right carotid artery in this patient who obviously is high risk for surgery with a, uh, a difficult radio opacification, uh, uh, tracheostomy in place, and so on. And uh, the, the wire is then driven around. Uh, and then we can advance the catheter and the sheath and take advantages of changing of these shapes as we go along. Next. And here's an example uh, showing you um, the quality of angiogram we can get with hand injections. Uh, you don't need power injections through the leader catheter. And one of the differences here is if you're doing a carotid procedure, by the time you get to this point, um, the only thing you have to do is deal with the stenting. You, you One catheter, one wire, one sheath, and you're fully positioned. Next. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, here we're beginning to do our measurements. Again, the leader's been repositioned to a lower position, more optimal uh, for stenting. And we can, of course, uh, look at the contralateral circulation as well, all using the same uh, catheter uh, uh, and wire and sheath. Next. Um, these devices can use really almost any wire um, that you're comfortable using, by the way. Um, there's a variety of wires. Uh, you, can, you can alter the steerability, uh, whatever, whatever whatever type of wire you think might be most appropriate. Um, here's just a stepwise sequential deployment of the stent and, and dilation all the way to the image on the right. Next slide, please. And as we uh, begin to look at the completion angiogram, again, uh, you can see um, the, what it looks like uh, following completion of the procedure. Um, moving on to other applications, you can see uh, for very complex um, high radiation dose uh, procedures such as this complex fenestrated graph where you're worrying about uh, putting devices through multiple fenestrations, uh, operators very close to the abdomen and the pelvis subject to a lot of scatter radiation, 
that there's a potential role, and, and, and we have actually used robotics, and in Europe a number of sites have used robotic uh, catheterization for the purpose of uh, positioning these various uh, branch stent, stent grafts that you see here, uh, using imaging fusion and robotics, the potential to reduce contrast and reduce x-ray dose, uh, particularly to the operator, but hopefully to everybody by reducing procedure time. As we move on, uh, this is my colleague, Dr. Pena, who's actually uh, uh, doing this fenestrated case, and uh, uh, teams can get involved, and uh, there can be a lot of dialogue while, while you're continuing to work. Um, following uh, fenestration, as you can see here, stents are placed, uh, uh, placing multiple uh, stents and devices through these fenestrations, uh, uh, and then we finally do completion angiography on the next slide, as you see here showing successful performance of the procedure, and then finally 3D uh, reconstructions uh, as we move on to the next slide, um, show what can be done with robotically assisted fenestration. Next. We can move on to the next slide. Now, I mentioned earlier the, the six French device, which we found very helpful for a number of uses. You're going to see a lot more of that from the other speakers. Again, uh, concept of putting a, a proximal bend and a distal bend. The concepts that are used here are different than manual catheterization. It's not just a question of creating a shaped catheter, because we're driving these catheters through blood vessels, uh, not just using a specific shape to cannulate an osteum and then tracking them over guide wires. As we look at the, uh, the next slide, um, and, and by the way, that six French catheter will take coaxial devices for therapy. Uh, and this is an example that my colleague, uh, uh, um, Dr. Gandhi, did in a patient that had very difficult anatomy and actually failed uh, um, during a prior chemoembolization um, because microcatheter advancement was not possible. As we look at the next slide, you begin to see some of the anatomic challenges. Um, as you see here, the iliac artery had a large uh, bend in it. And of course, any of us could get a catheter through this, but as you do, especially in a non-calcified artery, you're going to get you're going to get restriction on the torqueability of that catheter, that sheath, as a result of straightening out that very uh, large bend. As we look at the next slide, uh, you'll see the celiac anatomy, um, as you can see here, and the uh, r robotic catheterization of the celiac axis, uh, ultimately uh, 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 cannulation of the osteum, and then not beginning to uh, to drive the guide wire um, through through the vessel. Um, you can use 3D anatomy and other roadmap or you kind of go back the old fashioned way, the way we used to uh, catheterize osteo by knowing where the anatomy is. And here you can see an example of the celiac anatomy and some of the challenges in getting a, a catheter distally. And of course, any of us look at this anatomy and say, of course we could do this. Uh, I think most of us feel quite comfortable with our manual skills, but it, uh, you know, we all know that there's failures as well. And so here's an example now of the robotic catheter placement of a wire uh, and how the wire is sort of driven there on the left and now on the right. You'll see the uh, dynamic imaging of our ability to actually drive the wire and shape it, uh, the catheter rather, into a distal location. This is not a tracking process. It's actually a driving process over the wire. Next. And now you can see a very distal location. Um, which uh, in this patient with, with a very large hepatic mass that you can see here. As we move on uh, to the next slide, you'll see the, uh, the placement of the microcatheter and ultimately uh, primary therapy. And here's the uh, position of the uh, microcatheter and ultimately uh, properly positioned for embolotherapy. Uh, moving on to our next images, uh, we'll be able to see um, uh, the, what it looks like uh, following embolization and then following treatment. Uh, um, the interventionalist who did this case had several observations uh, which are demonstrated on the next image uh, to follow, thank you, which, which, uh, which you can read for yourself here. The ability to get stable positioning and manipulate the six French robotic catheter allowed for a very easy selection of celiac axis. Uh, and these catheters are very much more stable than conventional sheaths that, that we use. The microcatheter placement was facilitated, and uh, um, the robot catheter potentially reduced procedure time and radiation exposure to the patient, given the fact that it was two procedures, and of course, improved precision and stability once there has been something we've seen in a lot of different embolization procedures. Moving on to our, our next image, um, I just wanted to show you briefly the, the sort of range of types of 
experiences we've been using robotics for is we try and explore where it may have a sweet spot for clinical application. And they include a diverse group of complex procedures that you see at the top, as well as various types of angioplasty and stenting. Um, we have made some attempts at, uh, at, at using this as a crossing device, and then of course a considerable amount of embolization, including delivery of large devices like uh, amplatzers and smaller devices like uh, um, uh, chemoembolization, microembolization. In our next uh, slide, um, I just want to briefly uh, mention the Rover re registry that you heard about earlier, and this is an attempt to engage uh, users that are involved in the trial in a uh, uh, both pres uh, it had been retrospective, but now it's pretty much mostly prospective, uh, uh, multi-center, uh, non-blinded registry. We're collecting a lot of data to try and understand um, what the impact uh, and clinical applications for robotics might best be uh, used for. Finally, uh, um, there is a technology roadmap, so what you're going to see today is really a little bit about what exists, but uh, we're looking at techniques uh, of advanced imaging integration and localization. That's both the catheter tracking using 3D imaging to try and get to floralist procedures, and both Hansen and some manufacturers are working on this. The use of simulation with robotics uh, to reduce procedure time the potential for telemedicine integration, and then more remote c control abilities, including microcatheter control, therapy the delivery, and contrast injections, which right now are being done manually. Um, we've also implemented, and uh, this is widely available, uh, a mobility option, which allows you to move the, uh, the arm in particular on and off the table, or even in certain situations from room to room. Next. So in summary, uh, I try to share with you some early clinical evaluation which demonstrates definite value in anecdotal situations. I've tried to share a couple of these with you. The next step for, for us, uh, as you hear more, is to try and look at clinical trials designed with specific endpoints that could pr possibly create a tipping point to decide about robotics and the value of robotics. We're currently doing a subset analysis on radiation and flora time, and we're looking at radiation, uh, we're doing a radiation study uh, through the rover registry, looking at those to the operator team and patients. And then finally, uh, looking at success and morbidity related to this device. And at this point, we've had no uh, device related to morbidity in any patient. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, appreciate the opportunity to share this.